right, so we are back once again. JD, how are you today? All good, all good. What's up, my guy? Oh, man. Holidays, it's like no one wants to answer the phone. No one wants to take a meeting right now. Man, yeah, it's slow. It feels good. <laughs> <laughs> but I think today's going to be a really interesting episode. It's your guy, none other than legendary. Legendary is the key <laughs> word here, right? Legendary physical trainer uh, extraordinaire, Peter Park. How are you today, Peter? I'm great. Uh, it's good to have you. Yeah, it's good to be here. <laughs> so, so JD, do you want to give people a little bit of background on how you know Peter? Yeah, um, probably like eight months ago, I um, was out here in LA and a few of my football friends' season had just ended. This was around January. And we were, these are guys that I usually work out with during the summertime. You work out with NFL guys? Man, a few. <laughs> Unfortunately, a few. He holds his own. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but um, yeah, so we were, we were just looking for somewhere to train. The guy that we usually train with, he um, got hired by the New Orleans Pelicans. You know Mike G, right? Yeah. And um, we used to train with him in Sherman Oaks, but obviously he's a, uh, Got an NBA job now, so hit him up like, yo, who else is out here? Send me Pete's number. I meet him one day in a garage down hmm. in Beverly Hills. I remember that. L literally. It's like covert operations <laughs> around here yeah, to find to find the right guy, to find the right trainer. But like, I don't know. It's it's. I think the young guys this past year were calling it the cave. That's literally what it is. It's like right around the corner from Rodeo Drive, like in the midst of everything. Wait, tell me more about this. So there, there's a there's secret location. Basically, yeah. basically. No name, nothing. Yeah, really. He, he, he gave me like a paragraph to find it. Like go down this alleyway, you can see a, a X at the top of this. I don't know, man. This it's, is hot gossip once again. Yeah. Once again, so so <laughs> the secret. It's near Rodeo Drive. That's all you're gonna give us. Yeah, yeah. That's about it, man. You, you got to know. If you know, you know. All right. I like I like this. So so, is it Peter? Peter? How? What should I say? Peter's fine. All right, Peter. So, Peter gives you the word, the bat signal, and then what happens? Um, yeah. So we just meet. I let him know, like, yo, I'm, I'm gonna have a lot of my friends that want to work out, and then yeah, me and my boy Frank Clark from the Seahawks, we started training with Peter, and it's been on ever. Since. It's been hell ever since. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, they didn't like the stretching even. Man. Oh, man. Hardest warm-up. <laughs> hardest warm-up you, you'll ever see, but he gets you right. So, so Peter, why don't you tell our audience out there, just give them 30 seconds on you. I mean, look, we know you have an incredible athlete, celebrity, uh, you know, people that you train, um, but give the people just 30 seconds on you and, and, and your background. Started out as a college volleyball player. Quickly realized I was too short, switched, and then within a year, I I just saw the Ironman race on TV, and I go, I wanna do that, so six months later, I did an Ironman. What year was this? Uh, 89. All right, bat, so you're like OG yeah. triathlon man. Yeah, yeah. so yeah. did that, uh, did that professionally for about 15 years. Went to, graduated from UCLA at the same time I was doing that. Then just ever since I was in high school, every, t every time we worked out, I always seemed to make up the workouts, like with anybody. Like, so I just always gave my friends training programs, and I was just really... But back then, it was totally different, right? I mean... Oh, yeah, it was way more just by feel. I mean, we used to ride 400 miles a week and run 80 and swim, and now it's all scientific. In fact, I think too much. There's not enough feel. Everyone just goes by their HRV, and their, you know, there's no feel. It's just by the numbers and they're like interesting now. too much it's data like drago <laughs> versus <laughs> versus rocky right. and a lot of people just forget how to just train their asses off and and get there with hard work and they it's just a, a little different these days with uh i think with i think you, with everybody why is that i just think the world's different with phones and social media and you know things they see on social media drive me crazy just you know everyone has their best picture out there and it's not like that. You know, you want see someone's social media and you think that's how they live. It's not really that way. <laughs> <laughs> so it sounds like your approach is more um, really just built 
around doing the work. E- like it's the simple. No, the get simple on stuff. Wrong. I have you know I'm I train pretty simple, but I I have a lot of science behind it too. I don't just you know make people throw up for no reason. It's like <laughs> I have you know they need to peak at certain times and be strong, and I've just developed a system over. I mean, you know, I don't think anyone else in, likes training more than I do. That's what I think separates me from a lot of people. It's like, it's my, it's like, what I, I love it. I live for it. I mean, I have since I was a kid. Yeah. And you have, I mean, it, it, I should mention, I mean, you have a ton of ba- uh, professional baseball players. Yeah. I've been like, I've, you know, over the years I've had some, you know, I've had a good mix of very, Famous athletes in all sports, not just basketball, baseball, golf, triathlon. Why do you, why do you think they called you up originally? Like, how did that happen? Give us, give us as as JD would I say. I think give a us lot of it comes from give word of mouth. Story. You know, you got to have the results. So people, for instance, my big break I would have to say was from Lance Armstrong. He came to Santa Barbara. I'd known him from racing triathlons when he was really young. So he called me when their team used to train in Santa Barbara. And he goes, oh, my team's here. Can you just train us in the off season in the gym and, and do stuff? And I started doing that. And then from him, when he got, you know, this was when he had, before he had cancer even. And then he got cancer and then he came and he won, you know, all those Tour de France's. And with from him, he got, I mean, I used to travel with him and he was, he was probably the most famous athlete in the world. I mean, we'd go to Vegas and it was like Jesus was walking through the room. It was crazy, crazy stuff. You know, it was like the Michael Jordan. It was like he was in that, in that kind of, you know, category. And so from him, you know, of course, he gave me a lot of my breaks from in L.A. from, you know, Casey Wasserman and, and, and introduced me to a bunch of and I started training his draft picks. And from there, that's where I kind of got known. It was just that perfect example of being good and having the con, you know, knowing people in which helped me with Lance really helped me get ahead in my career. Just I was I knew I was good, but I was just in this little town and didn't have the you know, that one big break. And that was definitely my break that put me, you know, in the stratosphere. So it's, it sounds like Lance was your big break. No, for sure. And Lance knew you from the triathlon stuff. From a long time ago, from when he was, you know. 15, and is that just 14. by chance, by random chance? Uh, yeah. And then we had a mutual friend in Austin. So whenever he'd come to Santa Barbara, we'd go to dinner and we, I just became friends with him. And then he got cancer and then he came back and, you know, all this, all the, you know, they, every team dropped him. He, he pretty much was, you know, they thought he was done. But then, of course, he came back and he, you know, he's got that will more than anyone I've ever seen, any athlete I've trained. He's trains harder and smarter and more intelligent than anyone I've ever seen. So he had, you know, he came back and, of course, he, he you know, the story of the cancer and yeah, say what you can about the drugs, but it's. And it's you still have to work your ass No, off. that's not what got him. <laughs> I mean, they were, you know, the whole, the whole, you know, cycling community was doing it at that point and so 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 it sounds like uh to me you have this moment with lance armstrong did you realize that you were building a a giant training business at at that point no it just happened so organically all of a sudden you know i'm getting oh you know he's you know al horford called me and you know the other people that i trained in the draft picks and you know famous actors and i'm like oh you know it just became like this like whoa it just became, just happened organically where I didn't, you know, every day where I, I look back now, I'm like, oh, wow, I'm glad I didn't get an ego back then because you know, it happened <laughs> pretty fast. We talk about that all the time. I think you can attribute a lot of that to the L.A. area. Like, all you need is one and yeah. shit can explode after yeah, that. Yeah, I, I tell my young trainers, it's like, you know, you get one and there's tentacles from that. Right. And if you do a great job, you're going to get those tentacles that go out and you're going to if you separate, I mean, you have to separate yourself. If you don't, there's a million horrible trainers here, and then there's good ones, and and sometimes the horrible ones get the tentacles because they just have those ability to do it. Right. And so, you know, if you have the best of both, then you're you're really good shape. Did you uh did you create a vision and a foundation for your what you offer for your product, for what you sell? It, it, with training, did you have a foundation that uh, you built over the years with Lance that you now apply to all athletes? Yeah, I just, I just I always, my goal is to always give a shit more than anyone else. <laughs> That's basically, I mean, all 
go that extra mile. I'll do whatever it takes to get him. I'll get him a sports psychologist. I'll get him this. You know, I'll call him all the time if I know there's some family issue. I mean, I care. It's not that I, I'm doing it for work. It just comes naturally to me. So I think with the big athletes that I train, I think I'm a life coach as much as I am a trainer as far as doing I mean, the training is like 10% of it. I mean, what they do with their food and their sleep and they're down regulating and there's so much more to it than just training. It's like not even training is like a small part of it. And my, what I think is what makes an athlete. Yeah. Training uh, is only 10% of this. 10 to 15. I mean, they have, they're, they're these guys that are where they are, are like their racehorses. I always, you know, Lance always said it too. You're not going to train. You're not going to turn a donkey into a racehorse. You know, <laughs> They're there because they're good. I can keep if I can keep them out there doing their thing and they're strong and stable and healthy, and keep their life in order. I mean, that's part. That's a lot of it with these. You know, a lot of the young guys. You know, they go party till three in the morning, and then, you know, they have that music in their head all day. They don't downregulate. They try to come to practice, and then you know they can do it when they're twenty. But when they get to be twenty-five and thirty, if they don't start eating well and and doing that, you know, it's uh, it's. You know, it's lights out, and that's what you'll see. Some guys in the league for a long time, and others for two years. They'll they'll just be in and out. Like for instance, I train um, Justin Verlander, who's a pitch, you know, pitcher. And of course, he wants to pitch till he's forty, forty five. Incredible major league pitcher. Forty I mean, to forty five. So we're, you know, my big thing. I've been, you know, researching and talking to mentors that I have in Russia and all over about okay, how can we keep this guy throwing one hundred miles an hour till he's forty five. What, you know, how, what training techniques and life hacks can we do to keep him, because you know, he could break every record in the, in the books if he, does, and he's still throwing the best he's ever had. He's, you know, he's 37 now. So what, so, so walk us through that, that case. Like what, how do you approach so, that? Well, you when I first met that? him, he didn't have a lot of uh, good training, you know, in, in his background, like as far as getting strong and mobile and realizing, you know, eating good and, you know meditating and the, all that stuff he he just got you know he's a, one of he's crazy talented you know he's got great mechanics but you know he realized if he wants to keep going you know he almost won the Cy Young award this year I mean if you if he wants to keep going it's okay he number one he has to you know recover he's older so we work on his eating and his sleeping and you know little you know staying away from alcohol and you know just learning to downregulate a little bit and not be so when you say downregulate what do you mean for well you know meditate you know people a lot of people can't you know shut off their brain you know they just they at night they just always break you know a lot of my people especially the ceo guys say i wake up at three in the morning i can't go back to sleep because i'm thinking about business stuff and they just can't shut their brains off so learning you know and that's you know i've worked with a, a sports psychologist mike gervais who's really helped me you know figure that side of the equation out with athletes and, and just normal people that you can't just go 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 and and never shut your brain off you won't recover so you're intentionally building these these periods of rest right you know whether it's a nap or you know doing 10 minutes of meditation every night you know just learning to do that that was a big deal for just for me because i had a hard time saying no to things and i'd always i mean i was like a rat in a cage you know just constantly never sitting still and I, you know, that was the one, one thing Mike taught me is like, okay, you got to stay out of some stuff and, and, and have a little bit of downtime. I wasn't very good at that. Yeah. I still not. I still struggle with that. Yeah. I mean, it just, it seems like people in their early twenties just don't have that skill. And then as you get older, you, you, you just you have, have to, to, you just have to face that. Yeah. So then the training with Justin, you know, he's got to keep his fast twitch muscle fibers. So staying away from certain types of training and only, you know, cutting it down to just the amount that he can recover from. It's a big, it's a, it's a, you know, every athlete's a little different. So you kind of got to look at every athlete and some can handle a ton of volume, some can't. So it's, it's a big puzzle. Like when you get a guy have knowing what, what is the best for them, not just for yeah. everyone. If, if training is only JD, if, if training is only 10 to 15% of the whole package, uh, I know you work with a number of NBA players as well. I mean, how how do you get how do you get these young NBA guys? How do you get well, training, your I train, I mean the weights and that stuff. I mean yeah. their training on the court is what's most important. That's you know, I if if it becomes between okay, you're gonna go practice basketball or miss me, of course you're gonna miss me. you you play basketball, that's your thing. Yeah. You know, I'm a supplement and I try not to make it so intense where they have to, you know, they can't play. You know, I when I was younger, 
you know, I'd be happy on the baseball. Like, oh, I couldn't even play baseball because I was so fucking fried. You know, I couldn't even go to practice. I'm like, oh yeah, great. Now I'm like, okay, that's not okay. You yeah. have to be able to go to basketball or bas- baseball or basketball and play. So I've, I've grown a lot in that way where before I would, you know, destroy people in the gym. Yeah, it'd be like, you know, CrossFit, but, you know, times four. You know, not 20 minutes, you know, more like, you know, an hour and a half. <laughs> and, you know, that, but that's just maturity and, and seeing what happens to people and injuries. And, you know, if, you, if someone gets injured, they backpedal, you know, two months. Right. So keeping them out there is, is the most important thing in my book. Yeah. Um, to answer your question, I think it's just um, what Peter was touching on just in terms of um, mentally, if you can gain a connection with a guy where he knows that you care and it's deeper than just, hey, lift these weights. Um, it's the human element of it. I think what he's getting at uh, initially when he talked about like the science and data, like to a tech guy, science and data is shit 90% of what you know what yeah, I'm saying? That's how we make decisions. Yeah. But, you know, in sports, you're dealing with humans. So I totally agree with you. I think it's the science and, and data portion of what's being implemented into sports is oversaturating everything and it's and it's it's ruining a lot of good things, but at the same time it's enhancing a lot of good things. I think what you're trying to get at is just needs to be a healthy balance. And you do a good job at it. You definitely have the science portion of it, but you can't just rely on that. Like you got to be able to look and see, like, yo, this guy is tired. I don't care what these yeah, numbers say. Yeah, athletes have to trust you, too. I mean, I've had to let go, not let go, but it just hasn't worked out with some that just don't let me in. And they, it just doesn't, you know, if I don't know what's going on with them personally and everywhere else in their life, it's just hard. Because I'll come into practice and or into training and be, you know, complete assholes. And, and there's it's not because of me, but I can't, if they don't tell me what's going on, it's hard to figure out this thing I, I mean i need that that trust with an athlete or even a, a general fitness client i have yeah so how do you do that you got to earn it i mean you got to go in there and act like you care and really you know they just got over time you know the kiss of death for me if i have someone like harry styles who i train and i go out and tell someone something he told me that's the you know oh that's, yeah that's yeah you know and that people make that mistake or I'm not a big, I don't whore my people out on social media. I've never been able to do that. And much, I wrote a book last year called Rebound and I almost, you know, the, the, they were not happy with me because I wouldn't, you know, have Justin and those guys, you know, whore them out like, oh, read, read this. I just couldn't, I just can't do that. Yeah. I'm just not, that's not my thing. Yeah, you're a rela- you have you, you build relationships. Because yeah, and we, I don't want It sounds to. like the relationship is the key piece it, of the entire training. So, me, so that yeah. you can't. Play no, with. I mean, I have to say, yeah. I mean, most of my athletes I, I, I have for 10, you know, I very rarely have I not kept someone if I get attached to them. So I've had the same guys for many years. And I add a few new ones here and there, but the same ones I've had, you know, I've worked with John Carlos since he's been 18 or 17. Yeah, another legendary yeah. MLB player. Yeah. yeah. You still got the top spot? Remember, I kept asking you, like, I kept trying to compare him to Frank and different people. You say Giancarlo got the, uh, the top spot. I don't know. It depends. Frank's pretty crazy at some things. He's a different, yeah. different type of animal. Yeah. yeah, and that's what I love—the different, you know, like Frank. I mean, I think the first five workouts I had with him, he didn't say one word to me. I mean, yeah. nothing. Yeah. And it took that till he trusted me, where he would just talk to me about stuff. And and once that's that's ingrained, then you know we still text each other all the time, all right. even. When I'm not really training them, I just go, "Hey, what's going on? How are you doing? How's the, you know, the season? You know, we talk back and forth. So I keep that just, you know, because I know when he comes back, he'll probably come in. You know, when the season's over. Do you feel like you, uh, you need to be there for these athletes 24 hours a day? Are they texting you? Is it? Oh yeah, oh yeah, yeah. yeah I get stuff. I'm at a restaurant. What should I eat <laughs> all the time? Yeah. You know, I much to my, I mean, that's not a good thing necessarily because to my kids and my wife, it becomes a big issue. Like sure. I'll be at dinner and like someone will text me and then I'll get on the phone and my wife will just go, you're such an idiot. You know, like, <laughs> you know can you not let this go? Like for, you know, I mean, the kid, it does, there is that balance. I'm sure you've dealt with it too. It's oh, like, just where all of a sudden I'm like, oh my God, I am. That's so bad. I shouldn't, I should just leave my phone in the car. 
because I just, you know, that you hear that thing and you say, oh, you know, John Carlos Stanton, I just feel like I have to, you know, answer it. Or, and now they're used to it. If I don't answer in like five minutes, like, what, you know, a million question marks. Like, right. I'm like, come on, it's in five minutes. It's not, but that's what, you know, you have to go to that level though. I mean, if you want to be good. Yeah, and it seems like, uh, you know, we've talked to a, to a bunch of different people on this podcast who work with athletes, who are athletes and so forth. And it seems like, uh, for for them, they really have to be, um, how do I say this the right way? I feel like they have to um, be in a position where you, you just don't think about money really, right? Like for, like for you, like it, it seems like you've never made decisions in this business based on, never. on money no. at all. Never. Like this is a long-term. Organic. Yeah. The money's just always, you know, if you're good, you, you know, you'll earn it. Yeah. If you, you know, once you get, you know, that supply and demand, you know, issue becomes, you know, once. They... When did you know you had a great product? Um, pretty much when I was started doing the NBA draft guys, when I'd see how bad they were when they came out of college, when they came from college. What like year the, was I'd... that? Two thousand eight, maybe. Uh, ten years ago or so. I mean, they just come out. I mean, I mean, granted, a lot of them were only out of high school one time. I mean, one year. Yeah, one year. So, but I would just see like, just the necessity of them learning how to move right and basic stuff, not, not you know, they can jump and you, know, you watch them play on the court, they look like art, but you watch them in the weight room, they look like, you know, kindergartners. What is that, JD, is it, are universities not, I mean, I know it's just one year oftentimes with one and done, but like, are they not preparing? Yeah, so are, are those systems just not very good at this point? It 90, seems like they should be much better. 90% of them are awful. Yeah. Like why is that? Man, I just think it's um a culture within college where it's a buddy buddy system where you might not go with someone who is uh the most qualified, but it'll be something like where it's just a connection with whoever it may be at the school. And then it's just the mentality. I just I don't know too many strength co co strength coach colleges that embody what Pete is talking about when it comes to Valuing relationships and caring. It's drill sergeant mentality. Yeah, and they got so many athletes too, though. You have to give them a break. They have, you know, 200 athletes. They can't, they don't worry about what one guy does when he leaves the gym. You know, if it's, you know, he was shifting over to his right side every time he squatted, mm -hmm. you know, they're not going to correct that. They're, you know, they can't go to that kind of detail. And that's what I would see with the, you know, I just realized like this guy doesn't know how to do a proper squat. He can't go lower than like, 30 degrees without completely falling apart. Right. I mean, you're just asking for trouble if you see that. I don't care. I mean, they can play for it to you, but down the road, it's going to reek and it's going to. Well, I'm just shocked out. because with, with uh, the amount of money that's flowing through the NCAA system, the amount of the, the value, how valuable some of these young basketball players are, you would think there would be more of a culture of taking care of them and planning ahead, but it sounds like the, that work actually starts when they reach you now, uh, before the draft. Yeah, and but it's it's tough when you're a strength coach like in the NBA because you don't have much job security. So the last thing you want to do is hurt somebody. Like you do, you know, I mean, then you have to be pretty conservative because if you hurt them, I mean, you can get fired, and then a new coach comes in, you're done. You know, that's mm -hmm. why I don't, I don't think you see a lot of really top i mean top top strength people in the like the nba or the mlb or any of that because for one you don't get paid that much for what you do you can make way more money on your own if you're good way more like three times plus you have you have you're in control of your own destiny absolutely when you play in the nba and when you're a strength coach you know you get a new coach or some guy tears his acl and they in the crowd thinks it's your fault oh the training sucks that you know he, you know there's torn two acls and it's, you're gone. I mean, and even if, and I learned just from training my guys that the strength coaches, a lot of them, most of the good guys, I mean, I'd say 80% of them have their own trainers. So you're just kind of managing everyone's, yeah. everyone, you know, it's not like, you know, John Carlo. I mean, I write all their programs in the off season. He, the strength. So it's, su I mean, I've really gotten really good at being really good with the strength coaches and being on the same page and not being rubbing heads, butting heads against them. Cause that's, that's not good for the athlete at so all. So it's a team up. You have, yeah, well, when you have to, I, the first thing I do when I get an athlete is call the strength coach and just get that barrier broken down right away. Like, okay, I'm on your team. Let's 
what do you see? What do I see? Let's get this together. Because I, if you go against them and do something, you know, oh, this guy's an idiot. He sucks. Don't listen to him. It's just, it's not good for anybody. I think that's the first thing you did when uh, you called Seattle strength coach. Talk yeah. to Frank. It yeah. happened to be one of your good friends or something yeah. like that. So. Just because, you know, what do you see? What do you want to, what do you want to see him get done? What, what's his weakness? What do you see on the field or whatever? And, and if, then, we, then we have a good rapport and we talk all the time. And, and look, yeah, It's and collaborative it's, at that point. Yeah, but I've seen a lot of bad relationships where, you know, the strength coach hates the trainer and then it just becomes butting heads and it doesn't work. Well, I, I, I'm curious. Do, do it, there's so much money at stake uh, with the players and so forth. Mm-hmm. Does Is there a competition to stay close to that money with the trainers? And do you know what I mean? Like instead of it being a collaborative system where you're all trying oh, to totally. help the athlete, it feels like it's mostly about job security, you know, yeah. making sure you continue to get paid and, you know, stick with, with yeah. the player who's bringing in all the dough. Yeah. And you want someone, you know, the player is going to figure it out if you're not, you know, if they're getting injured all the time. They, they, I've seen some, you know, some athletes stay with really with trainers. I would just go, what are you doing with that guy? You know, they, they just don't, and they don't, they're more friends. It's like a like a posse thing than it is. They just their friend trains them, and they don't. They just stay with them, and you know they end up getting hurt. And there's a lot of that. Yeah, JD, with all your friends, do you guys gossip about who's who's the best trainer out there and so, so forth? No, that's not really. That's, <laughs> that's not how it works. <laughs> yeah. That's not really a topic of conversation. No, <laughs> probably. The, I don't know. Like, if me and Frank, if the topic of Training got brought up, like we would be like, man, that motherfucker Pete is crazy. Like, <laughs> <laughs> but like, we going back. He gets you right. You know what I'm saying? That yeah. it wouldn't be like a comparison. No, I make people, you know, try to get the best out of them. You know, like I know what Frank has to be in shape. He wasn't in shape, you yeah. know. So I, you know, he's he. I know he could be better. He still could be better. I still think if he, got, if I got him for a whole off season, he showed up on time. Right. <laughs> <laughs> That's a big joke between us. Um, <laughs> you know, he would be, you know, incredible. Like, like so I, I just try. I just go, wow, you guys play. If you make thirty million a year, you may, you play two more years. That's a lot of money. All right. You know, come on, you're don't blow this. What are you doing? Yeah. Uh, you know, yeah. a lot of people they don't see that when they're young, though. They don't see that that picture of. Walk us through someone where you did do that. Okay. Uh, yeah. A, a guy, AJ Ramos, he plays for the Mets. He's a closer. He's he's 28 now, but when he was young, I mean, he would come. He would thought it was cool that he'd come, you know, after being in the clubs till four in the morning. He'd get up at eight or nine, and you know, four hours sleep, and I'm I'm great, you know. But then I'm like, this isn't gonna happen. This isn't gonna last very long. And of course, he started getting some little injuries, and and we talked, and I sent him to Mike Gervais, the sports psychologist and we worked and worked and worked and now he's he really now he's he's way much more mature he's goes to bed on time i mean he still goes out i mean not yeah, get me wrong yeah. but he's learned to curtail it and realize that in recovery he has to crush recovery as much as he crushes working out that's the big that's a big difference people got to realize that the recovery is probably more important than the working out absolutely before i forget um before we start moving on you got to give the audience a little background on that summer when you got D Rose and Russell. Ah, you talk about how competitive it was. Yeah, and just how yeah that that group was crazy. Yeah, yeah that that was a one of my first draft things. I think it was, was that two thousand nine maybe ten, eight I think. eight or nine. Yeah, yeah. and it so was, yes, what they that, were that like, was like two thousand nine. Right? Yeah, something mm-hmm. like that. Yeah. yeah, yeah, and they were in the same. They were had the same agents, and they were in the same. I mean, it was like. Crazy to watch that. So Derek Rose, Russell Westbrook. Uh, who else was in there? There was a bunch of them. Who else was there? Was a lot. I can't remember. But I there can't was, remember. Those were the two big ones. But it was just one of those class. You know, those classes like in high school that all of a sudden there's one class that just has yeah. everyone. And you knew what you had on your hands. Oh yeah. Yeah. I mean, you could just see it, and you're like, "Holy crap! These guys are." It's, these it's guys one are of those amazing. crazy magical things that happens once every. So what did you do with them? No, it's the same thing. Just teach them how to move right. That's all, that's what I always do. How long does that take? It can take a month. I mean, because you know, it's just to teach people how to create tension when they do, you know, deadlifts, squats, just base. You know, that 
you can give, you know, once they learn that, it's a gift they have forever. But a lot of people just, you know, there's, I can walk in the gym and just go, okay, that guy's a really shitty lifter. He's <laughs> like, just by the way they set their body up for deadlifts or for squats or for cleans or just anything, you know, what they do for, you know, how they're, how much extension they have in their back when they do like planks and Turkish get ups and swings and, you know, kettlebell stuff is a really good place to see if there's a, if it's a good coach. Like that's how I kind of gauge people. Like, Oh, that's the secret. If I see some guy doing a Turkish a swing and it looks like shit, I'm like, okay, that trainer's horrible. They don't, I mean, because that's a hard, it looks really easy, but to do it right, it's not hard. It's not easy. There's a lot to that exercise. Yeah. You know, yeah. there's a lot. I mean, people go into hyperextension. They don't squat. They, they don't hinge. They squat. They arms are all over the place. There's no tension with their feet. That's a really good exercise to see. Kind of okay. Let's see if this guy knows what he's doing as a trainer. I love that. I, I know with chefs, it's it's uh, making breakfast with and and frying an egg. Exactly. Which is like you yeah. can just tell how good a, a chef is just by. Um, well, like I can look it. at any athlete coming in the draft pick, and I can go, okay, that guy had a horrible trainer. I can just tell. And there's always guys like uh, one of the guys that came in. What was what was the older the guy that uh, he was from? He was Terry's friend. He was a senior. He was one of the guys that was a Cameron. Cameron. He moved like perfect. And I and I texted his. I got his number, his strength coach's number. I go, dude, you did a good job. This guy's awesome. He could do everything perfect. You know, he wasn't the best basketball player, but he was in the gym. He was, you know, that's what I judge it by. He was yeah. perfect. Uh huh. Like, and he probably won't get hurt as much. He was strong. He was mobile. He could squat perfect. He could. He had no limitations. Zero. And then there's other ones that like, like, what did you do in college? Like, you yeah. cannot do anything. Like, what is wrong with you? So it's, you know, and then I know they didn't come from either that or they just didn't, you know, engage in the program. But like I said, you can't, when you have 200 athletes at a college, you can't really do get that nitty gritty with technique stuff. Right. Yeah. So uh, uh, have you ever, and this is a crazy question, but... Uh, do you do you guys ever create performance goals and metrics uh, to measure sort of your what you're doing together? Oh, all the time. Oh yeah, all, every year with uh, the baseball guys, and we, we we just go okay. By the end of this off season, we want you to deadlift say 500 pounds, you know, front squat, you know, 350, whatever it is. Yeah, we have definitely have strength goals because I'm a big strength. I want people. I have a, with every sport. I kind of have a strength number I want everyone to be at because I always think you know, they should be strong first, and then everything else. You know, yeah. unless you have a certain level of strength, all that other sport specific. Shit. Is there a key exercise with each sport, like with the football? Uh, and you know, I want you know the I call them like the tissue changing exercises, like squats, whatever, whatever squat. You know, every athlete has a, a squat. Like I'll look at them and. Some people can't back squat. Some people just look horrible. Like it's just not a good squat for their body. Some people can front squat. Some people can do the zercher squat. I, mean, I just pick a squat, one, whatever it is. And, and that's their main lift of squats. Deadlifts, everyone should be able to deadlift. Whether it's a hex bar, if they're, you know, if they're seven feet, they're not going to be able to go down and go to a normal bar. So whatever it is, you know, so those two exercises with like, you know, baseball players, I don't do a lot of bench press, bench press just because of their shoulders, especially pitchers. But I'll use bench all of those for major lifts just to see, you know, maybe a maybe a hand claim, you know, kind of where where I want to be. I mean, you know, of course, a, a motocross racer doesn't have to be as strong as a football player. So right. I, don't, I don't say, okay, the motocrosser, you have to deadlift five hundred pounds. I'm not going to say that. But and what about for civilians? Do you do, do you deal with? Oh yeah, you I do. Same thing. I always I I always pick a couple. You know. Uh, major lifts it's usually a squat or a deadlift somewhere in there yeah me and frank when we used to train up there we used to be like right after the ceo group i don't know what they did but you remember that like mm -hmm. around that time so we got like three or four guys pulling up in benzes and porsches and shit in there man so, so you're putting <laughs> ceos through hell i got well yeah i, I like the mix. i i mean i don't know if i had to choose one i mean because i learned so much from the ceos about everything you know what they, I mean, I just hear them on the phone. I'm like, oh my God, I shouldn't be listening to this. You know, <laughs> these deals these guys make are, are you know, multi million. And I just hear how they deal with it on the phone. And they just give me advice. It, that's where, you know, I can learn a, a ton from, from those guys. I think that's one of the most interesting things. And we were talking about it before we started. 
just and you made me think about it by saying that like you soaking up a lot like through, uh, through the experience of land seeing how he was entrepreneurial working out ceos like that's, yeah i mean i've trained probably four guys that are billionaires and just to watch their companies what they do and how they how they do it it's just it's it's you know, it's kind of like a like a fly on the wall syndrome. Like you know how say. they say that, like the 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 classic statement that uh, obviously health is wealth, and if you take care of your body, your mental will be um, be taken care of as well. Do you see like those billionaires no. percent? Like 100%. they have to get that workout in to be successful. Yeah, some of them. I mean, they don't realize they you know how important their health is. I'm like, you. I always say like, your money's gonna mean nothing if you. You know, you have a heart attack, or you. A lot of them, it takes a lot to get them to to make those changes because there there's a bunch of them that I've had. It, it's taken three or four years to get them to. What's the number one change there? Most of the diet, time? diet, by far. Just learning. You know, they're sixty, seventy pounds overweight, and and you can see the inflammation in their body. You know, they're just red and. They just don't move enough and they're always traveling on planes and you know it's just learning to prioritize and go look if you want to do it you'll do it if you don't you won't you know so so it's 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 interesting because you know i'm probably you know i always tell them i'm probably the only one that tells you what to do uh but again it's it's getting that trust with them i mean a lot of them it's funny because i say at first it's like getting to the president i have to go through their their you know secretary and their this and that and now every single one of my guys, I you know, it's never, it's just straight text to them, and it's that learning, you know, where they they trust me now, and they they that's another thing it's just with those guys, because they're so that's those are because I can make total hundred percent changes with those guys. Athletes are looking for that little ten percent yeah. change. I can change a CEO guy's complete life and make him feel like a different person, more energy. And they always call, you know, a lot of them say like. Ever since I met you, my executive function is a, is fifty percent better. Meaning they're just clear. Yeah. You know, getting them to clear out all that you know processed food and getting them to sleep a little better. And again, getting them to meditate a little bit and, and thinking about that stuff. Downregulate. Yeah, I mean they, they don't know how they're worse than the athletes. Oh yeah. They always have a million things on their head, and just getting them to move more and do it correctly. A lot of them, you know, they have that type A and they want to go. They'll kill themselves for two weeks and then never. And they won't do it again. It's like that typical thing uh, where the gyms love people to come in January 1st and sign up and then pay uh, auto pay and never come in again after January 10th. <laughs> <laughs> so to get these guys just to do the right, the correct program, like, okay, I look at their life and go, okay, realistically, you can get in three workouts. Let's be consistent with that. If I say, okay, do seven days a week, they could do it for like two weeks, but then they would never do it again. So I have to look at, everyone's different. I look at their schedule and go, okay, I can see you fitting it in here, 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 and, and make it so they're successful at first. If I give them too much at the beginning, they'll run for the hills and they'll they'll just go back to their own lifestyle. So it's a small little like, okay, let's start with two days a week. Just get on the treadmill or a walk outside, whatever, for two, just make it a consistent, like uh, every week, a, a consistent thing every week, even if it's two days a week. And then it turns into more and then, but. I'm pretty good at looking at the guy and going, okay, I know what this guy's capable of for the first month. And if you make it successful, they're they're gonna follow it. If you make it too gnarly, they'll they'll, you know, anyone can do it for a week, but it's to do it in the long term. You got to kind of look at where their, where their heads at at that point, and and kind of slowly trick them into doing more. But it it sounds like the number one thing is still diet. If, oh, yeah. if you can change someone's diet, you can change their life. Yeah, and that's you know that's just making little changes. You know, it's, it's not brain science. Just cut out processed food and sugar, and you're 80 percent there. It's pretty easy. You know, people just eat way too much sugar. Sugar is the worst thing. You know, processed sugar. I'm not saying fruit, and but if you just get rid of you know, you know, astronaut food, I call it. You know, <laughs> bars and and chips and all that stuff and that includes bread most bread yeah i mean i'm not a you know a gluten-free guy at all but yeah i mean if it's bread you know made in germany that has two ingredients it's <laughs> okay but if you get you know the bread you look at at the store here is has five thousand ingredients and sugar and everything else it's not even bread anymore so cut that crap out. This is for all of our entrepreneurs out there all of our ceos that are listening we have a large silicon valley audience 
cut oh. cut the processed foods and sugar. Sure. That's start exercise to... a couple times a week. At least just form a routine. Yeah, and that you like and make it fun. You know, don't you know if you hate running on the treadmill, don't do it. Do something you like, whether yeah. it's. I'd rather see people outside, like you know, walking up a hill or sprinting up a hill or doing something outside. And of course, I think strength training is the fountain of youth for older people. I think it's more important than cardio myself. If I mean getting, keeping your posture, keeping your your lean body mass, keeping your, you know, fast twitch muscle fibers. I mean, there's nothing worse than seeing an old guy that like goes in a, you know, baseball game on Sunday and tears his hamstring in the first phase because <laughs> he had, or does anything lateral. Like I had a couple clients, uh, friends of clients, uh, they had a pickleball tournament and there's like five torn hamstrings because those guys haven't moved like laterally in 20 <laughs> years. These guys are all big CEO guys. They had a tournament and, you know, they used to be good athletes, but they don't, you know, they, they don't do that stuff anymore and they lose it. And so that's where, you know, my guys, you know, they always do stuff some agility stuff and movement stuff and you know so they and it, i always if people can keep the ability to sprint i think that's important yeah that's se- that seems like a big one to me like if you, you can, can sprint, sprint across the street you know it's nothing worse than seeing some guy that you know looks like <laughs> running across the street they're like 45 and they just you know they just can't even figure out how to do it so just getting you know i try to keep people you know the older guys mobile and agile and strength training is a big part of that for me Amazing. Amazing. I think that's good advice. I mean, I think it's, uh, it's simple, but it's like, it, it doesn't no, actually take that the much. Right, it's just getting the, you know, doing the, the least amount to get the desired effect for these CEO guys. And this is coming from the mouth of someone who has trained everybody out there, every professional athlete, well, uh, mature, known to man. I've matured right? in and my that, areas. Uh, I just know what, you know, for, you can get away with very little if you do the right things. You do the right strength. You don't need to do, you know, it drives me crazy when I see trainers these days that takes them 40 minutes to warm up, you know, with their client. And then they, wor- they work out for 20. I don't get it. I'm like, what are you, they're, they only have an hour. Why are you doing correctives for 40 minutes? I don't, I, I mean, it drives me crazy, you know, sitting on a BOSU ball doing, you know, stupid stuff or just do a few goblet squats and a few glute things and get going, you know, get them. Make them do the exercise right, and that's going to be the best corrective they do. It sounds like, and this is something we often talk about on here, um, just did an episode with a friend of mine who has a candle business. And uh, I think the the hypothesis that we came with after the episode was she focused on her product first. And it sounds like that's, you know what I'm saying, that's the core of, you, you're not, like I said, like I tried when I initially got introduced to you through Mike, I tried to look you up and everything. I couldn't. I could barely find anything. Like yeah, it's more of that like word of mouth. Like I'm not worried about any of that shit. Like you, you look him up on the internet, you're not gonna find anything. But John Carlos Stanton, Lance Armstrong, four different billionaires. Like that's focusing on. Yeah. Yeah, I never think about the, the you know, the social media aspect or anything like that. Yeah, what I, what I heard very loud and clearly was you focused like hell on Lance Armstrong and you made that work yeah. and you worked your ass off and that that gave you this opportunity to continue to work with people. You keep you kept focusing on the product, like yeah. JD was saying, and that's what guides you. And you're willing to go the extra mile. You do full service. You make sure people are happy. Even if your wife and kids aren't so happy no, with you, I just you. became very good at reading people and not yeah. having a cookie cutter approach to everyone. You know, just because Lance can put in that kind of work doesn't mean a cyclist that's almost as good as him can do that. It's everyone's a little different, um, a little different, you know, mentality and in their body types. If someone like, for instance, I have two motocross guys that I train; they're big motocross guys, and one of them is pretty much. We did a DNA test. They're like. 90% fast twitch. So if I put a lot of volume on that guy, he would flounder. He would never, he, if I put him in a lot of endurance stuff and in, in the gym and did all kinds of stuff, he would never recover. Where the other guy was like 60% fast twitch where, you know, he could, you know, so everyone's, you know, looking at their genetics and what they do, you can form. I've just, that's just the experience that I've learned. You know, I didn't learn that right. I mean, I, I trained every, I just killed everyone at the beginning. But man, that's so cool! Your like DNA test, like that—that that wasn't going on in 1989. No, no, but they're easy now. You got the DNA in me. You got 
you know, DNA fit now, any of those things, you just spit into a thing and they, it comes back with your, how many percent fits fibers you have fast, slow, and it can tell you a lot on how to train a guy just by knowing what their muscle fiber type is. That's interesting. So what else? Fast twitch, slow twitch, anything else that we should look at? You can, I mean, you can learn, you can see how they process carbs, how they, you know, if they process carbs better, if they process protein better, if you, if they do any, you know, you can see a lot of stuff. Some people do really well on a ketogenic diet. Some people do horrible. So you can't like, oh, I'm a keto guy because you might do horrible on that. Like me, I, if I do keto, I do okay, but I'm way better with carbs. I don't have any problem with processing carbs. My blood sugar barely goes up. Where another guy, you know, their blood sugar might go up and they're like, we call a lot of the CEO guys what we call metabolic syndrome, where their just blood sugar stays high. That's why you see the big bellies. Yeah. If you see a guy with a big belly and kind of skinny everywhere else, they usually have metabolic syndrome. Where they got it, they would have to go on a very low carbohydrate diet to teach their body to process insulin better and get, you know, get a little more, uh, you know, sure at, at processing all that stuff. I need to work on that maybe. <laughs> well, you know, like I said, you'd have to test and see where you're. You know. Yeah, well, I and I think that's great advice, which is everybody is different, right? Yeah, um, every single person is different. There's no right answer for everybody. And that's part of your work. Well, that's where I'm really liking these functional medicine doctors that are pumping up all over the place. I mean, they just do. I mean, you go to your doctor, you know, your cholesterol is high, go on statins and, you know, do all this stuff. And, you know, you get a functional medicine. Well, why is your cholesterol high? Like, just because that number's high doesn't mean anything. You know, they go way deeper and they figure out what much more, you know, on what, why your cholesterol's high. And there's a lot of, uh, so a lot of my CEO, a lot of people that can afford it, the functional medicine has really come a long way in the last like three or four years. Yeah. Are there any other resources you'd recommend to show our audience if they're interested in pursuing more health um, testing and so forth? Resources online, people to read, uh, places to okay, go. You know, there's, you know, on the online you can find. You know, every, like I said, everyone's different. It's finding. It's basically finding someone that you trust that can do all that for you. That's what I do for, you know, I, I, I love that stuff. I mean, there's always good, you know, there's so many different camps though. There's the keto camp, the paleo, the vegetarian, the, I mean, I get confused and I can imagine what the normal person does on, on what, on diets and stuff. They just don't, no one knows. That's why I just say at first, just start with cutting sugar and processed food and let's see. If, yeah, there's goes. nobody out there that's like, oh, I'm supposed to be on a sugar diet. No. <laughs> <laughs> No, so there's a lot, there's just so many variables in here in America. There's so many with training. I mean, you got so many different, you know, you got Zumba, you got CrossFit, you got every, you know, so many different people don't know. You know, a lot of times the basics are, if you just stick there, you're going to do the best. Uh, I, I got two questions for you. One, I want to, later on, I want to touch on like the state of the athlete. But right now, you just talked about something I want to ask you about, like just the state of the fitness game. Recently, we just had one of my friends on here, um, former foot NFL football player, Omar Bolden, and mm-hmm. he's turning into a strength coach now. He works right. at Marcel Farm and he's the opposite. He's a beast. Yeah. Yeah. And he's the opposite of your business practice where he's all social media. You mm-hmm. know, he's part of our generation. Yeah. So um, we, we got to talking about just the fitness industry business within the fitness industry from a veteran's perspective like you who started in 89 to mm-hmm. see where it is today with the Zumbas and the CrossFits yeah. and this and that like how do you view all of that stuff I know it got to be pros and cons for you like yeah I mean the fitness has gotten huge I mean the, the industry is big but I just get frustrated because people don't it confuses the public and you know they just don't know my friends I have a really good friend Pavel who's a kettlebell he brought the kettlebell. Oh, yeah, he's big kettlebell. He's a real good friend. I mean, he was my mentor as a, you know, as a, you know, coming up. And I still talk to him almost weekly about stuff. And just hit the simplicity of his program is beyond. I mean, I can see, go to any gym and see anyone that's been certified by him. And, and they far are better than anyone else. Just by the way they teach people and, and, and the simplicity of, you know, you do push ups, swings, pull ups, and get ups. And you're, that's, pretty much all you need to do you know because people just get they go in in the gym and a lot of time i'm i'm really you know they just like the peloton is a good example right yeah, now yeah yeah people go on they go why can't i lose weight i'm like well you're going you're putting yourself in a lactic bath five days a week you're going to peloton racing these people five days you're not recovering I mean, what do you think is going to happen your body's not in 
harmony, you're just killing yourself weekly. Where if they would just do Peloton once a week and learn to go, it's that polarized that works. Either you go hard or you're recovering. A lot of people go live in the gray zone where it's not hard, it's not easy, it's just that kind of, you know, they go on the treadmill, go say eight miles an hour, they do ten, three sets of 10 on the bench and, you know, it's the same thing, mundane training. They, you know, they're, they're better than nothing, they're working out, but they want to get the best they can be. And just that, you know, that learning to go hard for very short periods and then the rest of it is recovery. So people just make it way more difficult than it really, and I think, most people, if you're into fitness, people train too hard, too often. Or they go in the gray zone too much. That's my biggest, they go, you know, there's that, I call it, there's three zones. Zone one is like probably 75% of heart rate and below. And then there's zone three that's probably 85 to, you know, 90. I'd say always train in that 85 to 90 when you're going hard. That's only 20% of the time. And the other time is just zone one, just building the base and, and recovering. And you're going to get much, much, much. And people don't want to hear that. But they, yeah, I think it's it's actually tough. Like, you know, both. Uh, it's like going to CrossFit class like cross, five it's, days a week. It's great. Yeah, it's too much. Two days a week would be great. But people overdo it and they go five. I mean, I, I love CrossFit. But if you if you go five days a week and you're going anaerobic five days a week and destroying yourself, it's only a matter of time before something happens. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that's what I'm dealing with. Yeah, and I think, you know, the good, and I've seen a a few really good CrossFit boxes that have, they say, okay, you're only allowed to come and go this hard two days a week. The other days we have mobility classes and, you know, zone one, you know, on the ski erg or whatever. That's where you're going to see CrossFit really do well when they have more, you know, I call them stop signs with people. Yeah. To keep them. uh, And then, you know, I've never agreed with the whole, you know, do... 100 deadlifts at you know 225 right. you know i just don't think some of those major lifts are meant to be done for that many reps right i think i think a lot of crossfit people places are i mean if you're one of those guys in the crossfit games yeah but you know they watch people watch that and they go oh i'm gonna go try to do 50 deadlifts at you know 80 percent of my body weight you know it's like okay well how many of those will be good maybe five yeah and then you're just asking to get hurt yeah i i, I personally see what you're saying and, and think that it's it's really tough to shut off for the average person, and the people I deal with, Silicon Valley entrepreneurs oh. out there, we go too hard. Trust me, I'd rather I'd re- if I could go hard every day. I would. I, I love. Yeah, I love it's, to it's push the my, it's, it's the best that. feeling in the world. It's more just for me for those for guys like a lot of my CEO guys. I have to pull them back. It's 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 me putting the reins on. It's what my job is. It's not making them go harder. They don't have a problem doing that. It's the easy. It's the recovery stuff. Learning to get on. A bike and go zone one, which is boring. But if you want to recover yeah. and feel good for that next hard workout, you have to. I think it was that Stanford running coach. He said someone asked him like, "How do you get? How do you get your guys to run harder?" And he's like, "No, you don't understand. I have to get them to stop running." <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. It's, 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 yeah. You know that for sure. That's the biggest thing I see in the fitness industry. People burn themselves out with too much high end training. Um. And like I said, the the last question I have, just in terms of your experience, I know you touched on it a little bit when it comes to Lance. Like, big topic on um, chance bending is athletes becoming entrepreneurs, mm-hmm. especially in in today's age. But I mean, you were with one of the original guys. Like, Lance dominated what early two thousands. Yeah. So to see it fifteen years later, like you got LeBron. There's still no one better than I've seen with Lance. I mean, I watched him in action. Yeah, he was. You know, he, like I said, he took a piece of the company. He would always surround himself with like CEO guys that were much smarter than him. I mean, he never even finished. He finished high school barely, and he's smart as he's a smart guy. He just surrounded himself like that. And I've learned from that. I, you know, in these clients I get, he surrounded himself with very smart people on his on all his boards on Livestrong, and he would always be drawn to the CEO types and learn from them. That's what I saw. He learned. You know, Lance is still doing very well with his his. Uh, investments and stuff so he would bring smarter people than himself around him so he could oh, he, would, he, would, he, he would form friendships with these older you know very smart business people and, and just learn from them i saw that firsthand I mean, we'd go to cities and he'd know every ceo guy there and we'd have dinner with them and you know he they wanted to know lance too because of, of who he was so it was a multiple it was a you know give and take and you know he just used that to his advantage 100 percent. i saw that i learned that really quick how did he how did he learn business like how did he learn to cut those deals 
he surrounded himself with these people yeah. from a young age from yeah. when he was he learned really quick he like i said he'd get advisors like and from them he would like those tentacles he'd go out and find this guy he learned he met casey he met you know irving azoff he met all these people and they would just help him with the you know figure out what to do and then he just he he became very very good at it and then now he's got like a mba you know, yeah, yeah, no more had, than an more than way an more because yeah. he yeah. traveled all over the world and 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 all different kinds of businesses and and so he used every you know he used he he was very smart with that and he that was a pre plan he knew that's what he needed to do like LeBron does there's certain people that just know how to do that some people there's or don't and are you are you do you help your your athletes with that as uh, increasingly more and more yeah you know, yeah I'll, I'll always try to give feel like oh you know why don't you you know meet this guy he knows a lot about this and maybe you want to invest in this or yeah all the time yeah a lot you yeah. know i think i think the younger guys are, are are seeing lebron and like kobe and those guys and lance and they say look if i do this right i can i can you know set myself up forever it's not this money i'm getting in basketball is not going to last forever yeah no it's a totally different thing in 2018 yeah. these athletes uh we, we get jordan i mean especially jordan uh, we all get phone calls and they all want to do business and they all yeah. understand what they're doing it's a it's a platform now yeah i mean jordan do most of them have money advisors and stuff absolutely yeah. um it just it varies you know a lot of times i see young guys come into the league and i think it's if you're a first round pick, you know you're supposed to have a money advisor, but I don't think they really grasp why until mm -hmm. they actually start to make money. Yeah. Like when you're 19 years old, like I have a money advisor, but you don't really have much money in your account. Like you know you need one, but it's until like, oh, I'm making a million. They just took 400,000. I see, like, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. I got property taxes. I got this. Like, once you start to actually do business, then they're starting to. Yeah, and then that word always, you know, that didn't wasn't around when I first started. Like, I got to brand myself. Right. You know? Yeah. <laughs> I, you know, what's your brand? I'm like, oh, what? <laughs> it's, you know, now I hear that all, you know, the young guys talk about that. Well, it's my brand, you know? It's like, you know, they're on their phone. I'm like, come on, you guys. You're like, we got to run the empire. <laughs> you know, it's like. <laughs> You know, they say that all the time. That's the new word. I'm running the empire. Mm -hmm. <laughs> oh <my> God. <laughs> Speaking of empires, what what's uh, what's up next for you in 2019? What does your your next year look like? Uh, I'm working on a, a new project where I have you know I have a gym in Santa Barbara, and maybe doing one in LA where I bring in uh, a functional medicine doctor myself and like a sports psychologist. So it's like a one stop. You know, because all these all, you know. For me, talking with the CEO guys, you know, they got their functional medicine guy, they got this guy, that, and then it's hard to talk to everyone. So if ever, it's, I would think if people had a place where they could just go, where okay, you got the blood work, you had the trainer, you had the masseuse, you had the the recovery center with you know you know contrast baths or whatever, I think it could do really well. So we're I'm going to do a like a, a I'm up in Santa Barbara as a trial. So I have a functional medicine doctor coming up there a couple of days a week, and then. A couple of PTs and 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 seeing and get the athletes and see you guys. Okay, you have one. You know, here you do your blood work. I talk to the doctor. I set up a training program based on what he finds, and then the nutritionist go see her. And so it's all it's just a one big. And I haven't seen that anywhere. And I just I just noticed from these CEO guys. I mean, they probably spend two hundred grand a year with all if you put everything together. Yeah. You, know, you have the, the right doctor. client base. You have the right client base to pull something. Yeah, so like they could, you know, just something. And I just want to try it out and see how, how it, how it pans So the out. first one will be Santa Barbara. Yeah, sometime 2019. Yeah, and then I'll do. We're we're, we're pretty much there. We'll start. I start like February. I have the guy coming up, and we're redoing the upstairs to make it more like. I just, you know, a lot of my CEO guys would go. That'd be great if everyone talked to each other, and I, you know, they said time is is money. You know, if I, if I don't have to go to a million different people and have a million people to talk, you know, usually if it, you know, okay, I have to get a hold, and it's hard to get a hold of a doctor, <laughs> you know, when you're, you know, to get people oh, on the phone, impossible. and then they're, out, they're nutritionists, and then this, and no one's talking, and it's hard when the, when the whole team isn't talking. Yeah, I don't think, I, th I don't think most people understand that it could take the better part of like, I don't know, a day out of a week to do all yeah, of that so stuff, and a day out of a week one, represents... If for these high-end people, everything's in one spot. Let's say 15% of your, your time or revenue 
That would like, be great. It, then it's yeah. a no brainer to to put it all in one place. Yeah. So that that's interesting. That's the no. That's JD. That's like that's what we're talking about, man. That's like you're you're making it. it you have a brand. You have a little bit of a brand yeah, going on. You have a brand. Like that word. <laughs> you're building the empire. <laughs> running the empire. <laughs> running the empire. Um, Pete, thank you so much, sure. Peter. This yeah, thank great. you. Uh, I learned a lot. I feel like I just need to like get back to basics. You do. Learn how to downregulate. You do. Uh, take it easy, but then go hard a little bit. So, yeah. yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, thank you. Thank you for being here. We'd All love right. to have you back. I will. I think we'd we'll probably have update. a... Yeah, we, we need a lot of updates, uh, but we love your work. Is, is there anywhere where uh, we can have our audience find out more about you? I know you're highly secretive, but... Uh, I'm not, I'm, I have an Instagram. I just never do anything. I mean, I do a tiny bit once in a while. It's a, uh, what is it? <laughs> Platinum Fit SB. All right. And and did you, you did you put out a book last year? Yeah, is that something you rebound. want? Yeah. Rebound. It's a, it's a, I wrote it for uh, mainly the CEO guys wanted me to write it. It's a book where anyone that's like 40 or above, or not even 40, 30, anyone that hasn't worked out in a while, where to start. It gives you, you know, mobility, nutrition, cardio, everything on this, in an intelligent way where to build. And I tell them, once you finish this, you can pretty much do any program you want. Like if you finish this, the, the it's like 12 weeks, you could do CrossFit, you could do much more safe, you could do, you could run a marathon, you could do. So if you're looking to get back into the swing of things. Yeah, safely. Take it from, from the guy who's trained Lance Armstrong yeah, and, that's, and that's everybody a, else. A program, it took me, you know, years to figure out what worked, you know, just trial and error. That's great. So That's I great. just wanted to put that up just for people because a lot of people don't know where to start. You know, they're like former high school athletes, like, oh, and they try to go back and do what they used to, and it doesn't work. Yeah. They'll just be frustrated and quit and go back and drink their beer. <laughs> 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 well, thank you for the time today. Sure. And uh, it's been a good one. Sure. Thank yeah. you. Appreciate you.